Sometimes we act like we, we, we don't believe that. Yeah. But Jesus is on the way. Yeah. Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. We, we ought to, instead of cutting out of church, we ought to be cutting into it. We ought to be getting in as much as we possibly can. When there's a service somewhere, we need to be in service. We need to be living for the Lord today. Tomorrow's too late. You need to start living today. I want you to think about this. If your faith is not strong enough to get you to church on Sunday, are you sure it's strong enough to get you in heaven? That's something for deep thought and ponder. Think about it. The unfaithful Christian today better wake up. Church is better than anything. Church is better than your kids' ball games or uh, a trip to the mountains or family reunion. It's more important than that. James 5, 8, and 9 says, Be also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Jesus is looking right now. Do, do, do you, you know, we talk about so much that Jesus is here with us. Do we believe that? I mean, do we believe that he's here? That he's judging us every day? He's looking at what we do. Where's your spiritual life at today? I can tell you this, the sands of the hourglass have quickly run through. How many turns on the six o'clock news at night? I can tell you this, you turn it on, and when you turn it off, you'll wish I hadn't watched it. You get so depressed. I, I, it's always, it's always murder, stabbing, killings. Somebody doing something just obscene, terrible. But you know something? If you're a Christian this morning, when it's off and still doing that, you know what you ought to do? You ought to shout. You know why? Because that's the Bible being lived out right there. Yes, you know. The Bible is being lived out each and every day. In verse 12 this morning. Oh, I didn't read the scripture. I'm sorry. Everybody stand if you would. We're going to read a few verses. Starting in verse 11 of chapter 13. He said that, that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, that not in riding or drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, nor in strife or envy, but put ye on Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Let's pray this morning, Lord, that it doesn't return void. Lift us up, Lord, and keep us strong this day. Keep us strong in the faith. Let us walk daily in the, the ways that we should. Put your hand upon us and keep us safe. In Christ's name we ask it all. Amen. In verse 12, it talks about there's a reference to the night. And let me tell you, we're in the night right now. Satan is alive right now. And he has brought darkness over the world. It is over the world. But I want you to understand, there is a day when Jesus returns to claim his possession, it's all going to be light. Amen. 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 No more darkness. Amen. Satan's going to be bound up. Jude 1, 6, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in, in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. 
Do you remember the commercials that came on from Direct TV? Some of the silly ones they had. One of them would say, uh, how annoying is it for your doorbell to ring in the middle of the night? You jump up and you go. You put your clothes on. You look in the mirror. When you look in the mirror, you see a bed head. But then you look and you don't hurry. You don't care. You hurry downstairs. You run to the stairs. You run down the stairs. You hit a toy on the stairs and trip and fall down the stairs and break your neck. He says, don't fall and break your neck. I changed the direct TV. <laughs> that was some of their silly commercials. That they had. Paul is saying this morning, when Jesus soon returns, don't be caught off guard. Amen? Amen. <laughs> don't be caught with your pants down. It won't be just annoying for Christ to return. It will be judgmental on you. Think what you did yesterday, what you did the day before. What if Jesus had returned at that moment, at that very time? What would you have looked around at Jesus and said? Well, I had to watch this ball game. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to speak against ball games, okay? But, you know, sometimes we forget to read our Bible so we can watch ball games. Amen. We do. The day is dawning that, and it's time to wake up. I, you know, I love watching little children on Christmas Eve. Don't you? Yes. You know, man, can, you just can't get them to sleep, can you? Well, I remember as, when I was a child, I remember it, boy, I was still awake at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. I was anticipating, boy, I was wanting to go down. I want to go down the front room where that big Christmas tree is at and see what I had. Amen. I remember that, even as a little boy. It's said, why, why was it? Because I was anticipating what was there. You know something? You ought to be anticipating Jesus Christ. You ought to be just as antsy right now. Longing for Jesus as much as you are for them Christmas stories. Amen. I can also remember the night before I got married. <laughs> I don't always anticipation or nerves. But I do remember I didn't sleep well that night. Amen. But it was anticipating what's going to happen the next day. We ought to be anticipating Jesus Christ returning today. Today, we should be looking for him. You know we could? He could come before we leave. Amen. Right now, Mount Zion Baptist Church is a sleeping organism. Our potential is through the roof. There's hope. We've got... Well, we got plenty of room for other people, haven't we? Our potential is great. We can have a lot of people. Mm. We need to anticipate that Christ will return. Second point this morning is it's time to clean up. You know something? You know what we are? I don't care what who your name is or what you think you are, you're a sinner. The Bible tells us that all are sinners. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We make a mess out of things, don't we? What, what, you're a sinner. What, 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 what if Jesus returns today? I'm a sinner. What am I to do? You're asking, you need to ask his forgiveness right now. Clean up. It's time to wake up. And then clean up. Verses 12 and 13 actually is the image of a, of a soldier who's been out all night partying. And for those that are soldiers, I'm sure you have seen them and heard of them. They stayed out all night and got drunk. And uh, the CEO comes in in the morning and wakes them up and says, Clean up and get ready for the 
for your dress right now. It'd be a, a, a dress inspection right now. Verse 13 talks about three specific sins. Social sins, sexual sins, and spiritual sins. First one we want to look at this morning is rioting and drunkenness. <laughs> For rioting, we are we use the, the English word carousing. Has anybody ever went carousing? You know what carousing is? Carousing is going out and inviting in alcohol and living it up. Amen? Amen. I've been there. Amen. I know. I know what it's like. I really do. And I carouse many times. But today we call it chilling or just hanging out. Just, just we're just going to throw back a few beers, but it's still carousing, amen. Look back to eleven o'clock again. If we don't know where our kids are, I tell you this: you're asking for trouble. If you don't know where they're at, you know where most people, most teenagers get their first drink is at a party. He's at a party with others daring to do it. They start passing it around. And my question for you is, why were they at a party that would be passing around alcohol anyway? You're the parent. You're the one that's supposed to control where they go and what they do. Then we have chambering and wantonness. Chambering is living uh, without the benefit of marriage, living together, shacking up. It's amazing that how these people can do this nowadays and, and their conscience doesn't even bother them. Wow, you know, uh, how many years ago it's been that that was almost unheard of, wasn't it? Unheard of. How many of you ever heard of common law life or common law life? Hmm? You said the law was you lived them so long you're married. Whether you whether you want to claim it or not, you're married. Now they don't do that anymore. It's amazing how just no conscience. Society accepts that now as a test drive. I want to take a test drive and see if this marriage is going to work out. It, it, they can they can call it whatever they want to. It's not the same, okay? It is never the same. There is no commitment if they're not married. You do not have to commit if you're not married to someone. Whereas if you're married to a person, you made a commitment to them. And they don't want to make commitments anymore. People just, just, they just don't make commitments. We accept that today as a norm. I can tell you somebody that does. God does not accept that. In God's eyes, that's still a sin. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. And I've heard people say, well, it's okay because everybody's doing it. You know, if everybody's doing it, then by definition, we're either a whoremonger or an adulterer. One of the two. I can tell you this, I'm glad not everybody's doing it. In all churches, though, you have people that are that way. You really do. You know something? That's okay. Why is that okay? Because we're a place for sinners to come and get help. I've seen many who live together for a while then, and then all of a sudden they say, you know, we need to get married. Had family members to do that and lived together great after that. And I've seen some that realize they're doing something wrong 
and said, wait a minute, we need to go our separate way. Then we look at wantonness. Now this is one that I can relate to. Some of you probably can't relate to it. I can. Wantonness is shamelessness about your sin. I don't care. I don't care if you, what you think about my drinking. I don't care what you think about my carousing. I don't care. You can love it or leave it. Amen? It's dangerous, isn't it? <clears throat> They'll even fake it put it on Facebook. I'm telling you, that Facebook sometimes. Whew, you gotta be careful. Amen? Amen? Hey, some of them don't know that they don't care what they put on there. Some of it is just downright filth. As Doris said, we can defriend them real quick. Or hide their posts and tell them why we don't want to see them more. I know we're not supposed to be hypocrites and, and hide our sins, but let me tell you, we're not supposed to throw them out there in front of everybody too and say, you either like what I do or you could want it. You know what you just became? You became a stumbling block to someone who was, that was probably this close to getting saved. You became that stumbling block. That tube we put in front of us, we call it television. It's got an endless parade of perverts on it. Some of the, I've mentioned many times about Wheel of Fortune. They'll have male contestants on there and they'll talk about her. They talk about his husband. And that just about makes me throw up when I hear that. Or they'll have a woman and, and they talk about my wife. Sick, sick, sick. When you no longer care about things like that, then you have lost it spiritually. It's time to wake up. You went to sleep on God. You need to wake up. Things like that should make you blush. Instead, what do they do? Today they're bragging about them, aren't they? <laughs> Homosexuals came out of the closet. And then we have strife and envy. Now, now Paul shifts gears here and he talks about some of the flesh to the heart. Because you're clean on the outside doesn't mean you're clean on the inside. Amen. Some may feel proud. You, you, you may feel proud because you don't get drunk or you're not a whoremonger. But God says, hold on a minute. Hold on, hold on. Take a look inside. What, what, what's your thoughts on this morning? What are you thinking about? Strife here really means personal ambition. It's a desire to be number one, to have power, to have prestige. To have recognition. It's a spirit of competition because we're worried about who's going to be in charge or who's going to get the credit for it. There's no place for that in church. No place at all. The Bible says a house divided cannot stand. <clears throat> we can't help it. Paul and Apollos competitions. <coughs> Pardon me. Pardon me just a second. If your head gets too big for the body, guess what? God will remove it. Amen. Those who don't lead lovingly will, will just rotate off into obscurity. There's no room for strife in the family of God. It's all got to be for Jesus. It's got to be all about Jesus. We've got to all be on the same team. 
We all got to be pulling all the pulling the nets in the same direction as fishermen and men. It's about lost sheep. It's not about us. Souls, souls, souls is what we should be looking for. Envying is jealousy. And if there's envying, it'll devastate a church. It'll de devastate a marriage. It'll even devastate a friendship. It's time to wake up, clean up, and stop being petty. And that's the third point. <clears throat> it's time to dress up. Now then, I'm telling you this. I'm not talking about the clothes you wear in the church. Okay? I would never do that. It's a time. Verse 14 is a positive and a negative. First, you positively put on Jesus. Your, your life should be about Jesus. Put him on to everything. Jesus. You need to get that word in your heart. Everybody say Jesus. 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 Amen. You wake up with a determination to grow closer to God chase after Jesus. We need to dedicate our whole body to Jesus Christ. Our ears, our eyes, our hands, and our feet. We need to dedicate all of those to Jesus. We need to live each day differently than the rest of the world. Come yet and be a separate people. We need to be separate from everybody else. In verse 14, he uses the, per, the full title for Jesus Christ. He talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, plan of God for our lives. Jesus, the pattern of God for our lives. And Christ, the power of God for our lives. Lord means master. A slave doesn't wake up in the morning and say, well, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. What does he wake up and do? He says, Master, what should I be doing today? Amen. The master tells you what to do. Lord, Jesus, and he lived a perfect pattern for our lives. And then Christ, he had the power to defeat all his enemies. He defeated sin. He defeated death. There's two ways to put on Jesus this morning. You can try to do it yourself. <laughs> See how far that gets you, okay? Or we can depend on Jesus for help. I prefer assistance. I don't know about you. You know, I, we go out, Joe and I, very seldom now, but we used to go out to uh, Hamilton Place. And you know, that's two levels. It's two levels. Well, you have three ways you can get up to the second level. You can walk upstairs, you can ride the elevator, or you can ride the escalator. Now, I don't know about you, but I can only escalate. I prefer their power pulling me up there instead of mine. Walking up them steps, amen. But on the negative side here, it says, make no provision for the flesh. What are provisions? Provisions is food, isn't it? Don't feed your flesh. Literally. To make provision means to plan ahead. <coughs> How many have heard the expression? He fell into sin. He falls into sin. You know, a lot of people don't fall into sin. They run and jump in. <coughs> Amen. They take a run and jump and jump right in the middle of it. <clears throat> and if we jump in, you know where sin begins? Right here. Right here. The Bible tells us that uh, lust will bring forth sin. If that's in your mind, then it's your thoughts. But we all fall and we all sin, both in thought and a lot of times in action, too. <clears throat> when a thought comes in, a sinful thought comes into your mind, before you take action, you know what you need to do? You need to renounce that sin. You need to, if we, when you even think about it, 
You need to ask God to forgive you for it and turn your thoughts to something else. Even when you just start thinking about it. Because if you don't, if you don't get rid of, if you don't call it a sin, what you're thinking about, the next thing you do, you'll start taking action on it. And once you start taking action on it, and the next thing you know, it becomes a habit. <coughs> and then after that, you begin to sleep. And you, know. you go into slumber and you say, well, I don't see it anymore. If you aren't saved today, now's the time. Right now. It's later than you think it is. It's closer to the return of Jesus Christ than this other day. It's closer this morning than it was yesterday morning. Amen. And it'll be closer. If you don't come today, it'll be closer tomorrow than it is today. I want you to think about what Satan does. When you're a young child and you realize you're lost and you need to be saved, Satan tells you, oh, you're too young. You know, some, some parents do the same thing. Right? They tell them they're too young. My wife was saved at a young age. If you, you, you can deny them. But when you're a teenager, Satan says, well, everybody's going to look at you. You're, you're too popular. You don't want to do that. You don't want to get into that old church thing. Then when you're an adult and you're in your working day life, I just don't have time. I'm just too busy. And then when you retire and Satan tells you, now you're too old to get saved. And Satan finally tells the truth. When you die, he tells you it's too late. You know what? He's actually right, isn't he? It's too late for you. Everybody stand for you. I'm going to close with this verse. 2 Corinthians 6 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. <clears throat> not tomorrow. Not next week. You don't need time to think about it. Right now is the time. Actually, we need to wake up. Whatever you need to do for the Lord, you need to do it this morning. Amen? I encourage you to come forward this morning if you've got something on your mind that you want to get done.